The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and verse 7 that as he thinks within himself, so is he. This scripture is identifying a wealthy man. And this proverb is giving wisdom in terms of how to, uh, how to associate with this man. This man that offers you fine dainties and things like that. He says, oh, be mindful how you partake of what he offers you because there is a motive, an underlying motive. And then he goes on to describe this man and the caution of when you're engaging people that have motives. You know, everybody who comes to you with a smile is not smiling on the inside. Everybody know that? <laughs> Just somebody who comes to you, especially people who come to you uh, telling you how wonderful you are and how great you are. And, uh, you know, that's not always representative of the content of their heart. So what happens is as you grow spiritually, you develop discernment. And while somebody is smiling in your face, the Holy Spirit says they have a knife behind their back. <laughs> Y'all don't know nothing about that. Right? And so what you want to do is just, is just allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you while you're in the position of engaging people so that you're not taken, so that you're not abused by them in any way. And the Holy Spirit is designed to protect you. So he says, because as this man thinks within himself, that's the way he is. So what that means is, is that he's representing who he is by the intents and the motives of his heart. You guys are good. I'm already going into my message, so y'all are, are free. You, you look relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this so this is a law everybody say a law. law that we extract from this passage of scripture let's just read let's just read up above it let's go to verse 6 and read so you can see what I'm talking about it says eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire his dainty meats. That evil eye means an ill intent, the wrong motive. He says, don't eat the bread of someone who, who has a wrong motive toward you. Don't desire the carrots he dangles before you. Verse 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, that's what he is. So eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Okay. But in this passage, verse 7, we extract a law. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. But that's not just for this man. That's for everybody. As any of us think in our hearts, that's who we are. And so we have used this scripture time and time again to emphasize the power of thinking, uh, the power of meditation, that you become what you meditate, you become what preoccupies your thoughts, you become what preoccupies your mind. So that's why the Bible talks so much about the mind. The Bible talks about so much about thinking and the importance of using the word of God as a spiritual substance of your thought life. So that your imagination grows the way and in the direction that God has intended it for it to grow when he gave it to you. He gave you your imagination. It is a divine gift. It is, it is the power of the mind that is used to hear and to see what God says. And again, when you see what God says, then you can have what God says. Amen? Amen. So... We're going to talk about no more limits. Say no more limits. 
Come on, tell somebody sitting next to you, no more limits. Come on, some of y'all look sleep. Wake them up, wake them up. Shake them a little bit. Say, no more limits. All right. Now, your limits are born out of your image. You, everybody in here have a framework from which they live. And you can call it borders or limitations. But if there are going to be any limitations, they should be defined by the power of the word that is working in you. But when we say no more limits, we're talking about no more self-imposed limits, no more natural limits, no more limits that you put on yourself based on your identity, based on your experiences, based on what somebody else said to you, based on circumstances or events in your life, something that occurred, something that happened. No more limits. Let God speak. Let God speak. Let God speak. And let every limit that you have imposed be defied and be denied. Okay? Let God speak. Too many times we let the circumstances speak. We let other people speak. We're not letting God speak. One time a man wanted to talk to me about some sort of business, and I said, Holy Spirit said, go listen to him. He says, go hear what he says, but listen to me. I said, hear what he says and listen to, yeah. Go hear what he says, but listen to me. So I'm hearing him, but I'm listening to God the whole time. And what God is doing is speaking to me while he's speaking, guiding me and directing me so that I remain on the path that he has chosen for me. So if my limits are born out of my image, which is the way that I see myself, if I want to expand, what needs to happen? Okay, all right, let's, hold on. I'm going to just repeat it again. If my limits are born out of my inner image, and I want to expand, I want to grow, what do I need to do? I need to change my image. Because as my image goes, so goes my life. So now, what do I do to change my image? Your limits are only as real to you as you think they are. Your limits are only as real to you as you think they are. If you think they're real, they're real, even if they're not. But if you think they are, they are. Somebody else can look at you and say, I see so much potential in you. I see so much. When I look at you, I see so much. But if you don't see it, if you don't see it, it doesn't matter what anyone else sees. Sometimes God will send those people into your life to, 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 to shake you, to cause you to understand there's more that you may not be aware of. If three people come up to you and say they see something, they see this and they see that on you, and you're like, man, that's the third time somebody done come and said something like that to me. That's God speaking to you saying, hey, I need you to wake up. There's something I need you to do. There are people that are waiting on the gift that's on the inside of you. And so your limits are only as real as you think they are. So when we talk limits, we talk things like most extreme degree. Do y'all have my, do, do, are y'all ready with my PowerPoint? Okay, I'll let you know. When we say limits, the most extreme degree, the most extreme degree, that's a limit. As far as I can go, a limit. It is the farthest point. It is, it is the, have you ever heard anybody say, that's, that's, that's all I got? I know that's not proper grammar, but that's how y'all talk. All right, that's how y'all talk. You know, that's, that's, all, that's all I got. How many have said that before? Come on, don't lie in church. Just, just raise your hand and tell the truth. All right. You know, or that's the best I can do. Right? 
Now, do you realize that if you're trying to get something done, something accomplished, and you get to the point that is the best you can do, but yet what you're trying to get done is still not accomplished? How many of you know we got a problem? Okay? And what that means is your best is not good enough. So one or two things must happen. You must change the best you can do or go from your best to his best. The Bible says don't be strong in the power of your own might, your own skill, your own expertise, your own ability, your own smartness and all that. He says no, that's, that caps out. There's a ceiling to all of that. He says, but be strong in the power of his might. What does that mean? That means take on the might of the almighty God within you. That means clothe yourself with his ability. God has allowed us to partake in his ability on us. And you're not excited about that. I don't know what's wrong with you. God has allowed us to take his ability and clothe ourselves with his ability to get the job done. To get the job done. <clears throat> he says, take my might, take my ability, take my strength to do what it is that I've called you to do. Because quite frankly, whatever it is God has created you to do and called you to do, you can't do it in your strength. We've tried that, right? Yeah. It doesn't work that well. We get so far, and we're out. He says, whatever you, I called you to do, whatever assignment I've given you, you must use my strength to get it done. You can't do my assignment in your life without my strength within you. And we use the word to get that done. Come on, give the Lord praise right there. Come on. Praise the Lord for his strength in you. Limits, 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 limits. One of my, uh, my first PowerPoint is, uh, is, is age limit. We, we associate limits with age limits. We say, okay, you know, if you're under 18, 18 or under, that's a limit. We cannot do what? Serve you alcohol. You cannot, what else? Huh? Cigarette. Come on, y'all, think of something else. Like, you know, I'm just joking. You cannot, you cannot do what? Vote. Okay? These are limits. In other words, it, there's a cutoff. When you get to a certain age that you can or can't do certain things, we associate limits with age limits. Here's another one that most people uh, have trouble with, including myself sometimes, is, is, is speed limits, right? Speed limits. Speed limit says you cannot drive more on this road than 65 miles an hour. But we give ourselves five more, don't we? Some people give themselves 10 more. You know, I, I usually hang around eight more, try to stay out of trouble as much as I can. But we associate limits with things like this, things like age and things like speed and things like city limits. We have boundaries and borders that we cross over one particular line. We're, we're either out of the city or we're in the city. And then sometimes these stores carry sales that says, you know, if you buy a certain amount of groceries, you'll get a, a free a turkey. And then we say, okay, Junior, you go and get $20 worth. Betty, you go get 20. Jojo, you go get 20. And we bring four turkeys home. When they say limit, one per customer. And we're all customers. But we know we've, we've exceeded what? The limit. Right? In the spirit, in the spirit, God has set things up to where your limits are, have been absorbed in him. 
your limits have been absorbed in him. He absorbed all your limits, but in him. We are creatures of creativity. And when you are a creator, there are no limits. The Bible says that we have been given, made a share of the divine nature of God. And part of God's nature is creativity. And you have that in you. Every person sitting here has that in them. You have creativity in you. You are capable of creating. That means, that means you, you're capable of bringing something into existence. Now, it's not from nothing. Making something from nothing, that's not what we're talking about. We're, the, it's something from something, but the something is unseen. The something is unseen. The unseen is the material substance called the Word of God. You're designed to take the Word of God process it through your heart and your mind, your imagination, and create something. You are a creator by nature because you are a child of God. Okay? Psalms 139.14 speaks to this. It says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God did something spectacular when he created you. He did something awesome. Say, put your hand on yourself. Say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And here's, and here's the deal. We're all given our own unique design. There's no one person in here just like the other. You're, you've all been wonderfully and fearfully made by God. And when you understand this about yourself, it makes you appreciate the person to your left or right. But when you don't understand this about you, you don't understand the design of creativity in others. You frown on them because they're not like you. You become disturbed by their expression because it doesn't line up with your expression. But when you understand how God made you, you can say, oh, I get it. He's just fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, she's not crazy. She's just fearfully <laughs> and wonderfully made. Come on, am I right? Every individual was designed by God with unlimited capacity. That's what's on the inside of us. Unlimited capacity. And God intends for you to use that for creativity and innovation. So stop trying to define what's inside of you. Let God define it. Stop trying to create who you are. Stop trying to paint a picture of what you're supposed to look like to everybody else. Let God paint that picture. Let God define you. So what if the person to my left or right don't get me? So what if I disappoint you with what you thought I was? You know, my job is to be who he has created me to be. Okay? You know, when, when, when I stand before God, you're not going to be standing by God looking at me. It's going to be him. And he's going to be the one asking, did you do what I put inside of you to do? Did you become everything that I've created you to become? Did you release everything I've deposited on the inside of you to release to humanity? It's not going to be you standing there. It's going to be God standing there. So my job is to make sure that I be who God has called me to be, stop comparing myself with somebody else. Say, I am fearfully. I am wonderfully made. Now put your hands together. Give yourself a hand. Give yourself a hand.
In the book of Daniel, there's this thing where Daniel is uh, being compared to the magicians of, of his day but they could not interpret the king's dream. It took Daniel to come in and do it. Bottom line, the Bible calls and says to Daniel, refers to Daniel as being 10 times better than the ordinary man. With, with the similar gift setting, similar gift setting, but 10 times better. Ten times better. You, with God, in you, are ten times better. Let's say a school teacher, but because of the Holy Spirit in you, you're ten times better. Listen, listen, listen. Yes, you have a degree. Yes, you're certified, perhaps. Yes, all of that. But because of the God in you, it still puts you out there 10 times better than all the others. 10 times better. I'm putting up five. 10 times better. Come on, say that with me. 10 times. That's huge. It speaks to your capacity. It speaks to your creativity. It speaks to what's inside of you. It speaks to the potential that is resting on the inside of you. You're comparing yourselves as though you're comparing, comparing apples with apples. You can't compare yourself with the world. You can't keep measuring up beside the people of the world and seeing how you, how you come out. You are 10 times better. The longer you do that, the longer you deny the 10 times factor on the inside of you. You have to know I'm 10 times better because God has made me 10 times. What, what God intends is for his effect on you to come out expressing it 10 times better than the people of the world. Well, yeah, the people of the world, they can do things, they have things, but the gift in you is 10 times better because God's on it and because God's in it. You're 10 times better. You're 10 times better. He found them 10 times better. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, he found them, the king of Nebuchadnezzar, found them 10 times better than his own astrologers, and magicians. You have a 10 times better anointing. See, I know y'all don't feel it. I don't feel like I'm 10 times better. That's because you don't think you are. This is, this is not about feeling 10 times better. This is about believing I am 10 times better. If you believe I am 10 times better, one day you're going to feel 10 times better. But if you wait to feel 10 times better, you'll never perform 10 times better. Come on, say 10 times. 10 times. 10 times better. So today, I want to introduce to you my guest, Dr. Antonio Rivera. Antonio, would you come? Let's give him a hand as he comes. Welcome. Happy to be here. Is it right here? Yes. Now, Dr. Antonio, you weren't always a doctor. I wasn't. And, and for clarity, you're a doctor of? Chiropractic. Yes. Now, I invited him to talk with us today to help us to become like a, like a living example of what we're teaching. so that we can see the practical side of this more. Mm -hmm. And so today you're a doctor, a chiropractor, and you're actually a 10 times better doctor. Yep, 100%. Of chiropractor. Yes. But tell the people the journey. Where did it start? Where, yes. 
how did this, what did your journey look like in the early days, even as a child? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. This time? Okay. Um, well, you know, I didn't, um, like Pastor said, I wasn't always like this. And um, I grew up in a little town called New York City. And uh, <laughs> it was Brooklyn, New York. And uh, that's where I was born. And at two years old, um, my parents passed away. And so uh, they both, you know, died in the same month. And so if you ask me today if, you know, if I know my parents, I don't. I don't remember them. And um, at that time, I, uh, um, the state of New York was trying to take me away and put me in the foster care system. And um, at that time, I had my siblings and I had my grandparents. And uh, my grandfather, he wanted me. Uh, my grandmother didn't. Um, she was too overwhelmed with my sister and my two brothers, so she was willing to put me in the foster care system. But, of course, my grandfather won. They took me in, and um, at five years old, my grandfather died. And at that time, um, my siblings, my sister and my two brothers, they dropped out of high school, and they went into drugs and drinking. And here I was with um, the person who didn't want me to begin with. So you can imagine how life was like. It was a lot of abuse, a lot of neglect. I was always, always told every single day of my life like that I was never going to amount to anything, that I was going to um, be just like my, my brothers and my sisters, either in jail, doing drugs, or just won't be here, or getting killed in a gang. And so constantly, um, I was told that. And at 11 years old, my grandmother died. And I got passed along to my older sister. And um, at that time, of course, um, I mean, the whole, my whole family, I mean, w was full of drugs and drinking. And um, of course, they didn't have a job, so they didn't pay rent. And so we eventually got evicted from our apartment. So we started living in the streets of New York. And... Um, so we started living in subways, sleeping in subways, digging out of trash cans, begging for food, stealing, doing, doing whatever we could to survive. Um, I was 11. My niece was with us. She was nine years old. Um, and of course, my, my sister was a lot older. And uh, we were with her boyfriend. We did that for several months. And it got to a point where my, um, there's this thing called Metro Ministries. Metro Ministries is a place in New York City where they find 2,000 kids all around New York City to bring them to one place to worship God and learn about God. And most of these kids are underprivileged, and um, I went there a few times. That just wasn't my thing. Uh, but my niece was part of it. She went every single Saturday. And um, so what they find is sponsors all around the world for these underprivileged kids, and these sponsors, what they do, they send gifts uh, for the for school, for Christmas, for birthdays, and so forth, and my niece is one of them, and her sponsors were in the state of Louisiana. Um, so we, we got to a point that we called them up, and the plan was that for me and my niece to move to Louisiana to get away from homelessness, and uh, my sister and um, her boyfriend had to turn, some, turn themselves into jail had to go through a program and deal what they had to deal with, and, uh, but for six months. And then after six months, my sister and her boyfriend moved to Louisiana um, to be reunited with me and my niece and uh, big happy family, start all over, get away from New York. Uh, well, it didn't work that way. They went back into drugs, they went back into drinking, and here we were in Louisiana with these two strangers that I didn't want to be around. I used to be... The, the shyest person on earth. Um, I was full of anger, neglect. Um, and it got to a point where my niece has a family back in New York City. My whole family passed away. All I have is my siblings. And um, they are all addicted to drugs. And so at that time, my niece got in contact with her family in New York City, and she actually decided she wanted to go back. And 
leave the, situ the situation that, uh, that she had in Louisiana. When I met this family, I didn't know nothing about them. This family, they put rules on me <laughs> that I never had rules. Um, they tried to dis uh, disciple me. They uh, started taking me to church. They started showing me a different way of life. It was the first time I heard I love you. Um, and they kept saying it. I didn't know what love was. They started taking me to church. Um, I remember the first, the first time they, took, they picked me up from the airport. They drove me to their house and they opened the door and they opened the door to my bedroom and said, hey, that's your bed. Um, that's where you're going to sleep. And at that time, like, I've, I haven't slept in a bed in a long time. And so I didn't even know, I knew how to get on the bed. I just didn't know how to put the covers over me. Yeah. So they literally had to teach me how to put covers over me. And they had to teach me the most simple things that, you know, that we all take for granted. Um, but they taught me a different way of life. They taught me a, 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 a life of success, of love, of clarity that I didn't have to be like my family was. And so, um, and my, my niece saw the same thing I did. And so she decided that she wanted to go back. Um, I had the choice. I had the choice to go back with her. Um, but I chose not to because I saw a different life. I saw the love of God. Um, and what broke me was the love of God because I, I saw love in a way that I never felt before. Yeah. It, was, it was so tangible. Um, it was overwhelming. And every chain that I had, every shackle that was stopping me, Every, every fear, everything that, 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 that of my past, is, it was like it was, I saw it break. You know, of course it wasn't easy, it didn't happen overnight, but um, I decided to stay with these people that, that I saw a different life with, and she decided to go back, and um, since then, long story short, since then, I'm the first person in my family, in my family to graduate high school, to, 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 to graduate um, college, to get a degree, to become a doctor, um, to, to own my own business, and to allow God to use me in a way that I never thought he'll use me. You know, and it, as I think back, you know, I don't share this story a lot, but when I think back, you know, and see where I came from, it's like there, there's absolutely nothing impossible for God. I mean... Like, I'm convinced, I'm 100% convinced there's nothing. There isn't. If he can take me from the deepest, darkest place in New York City and bring him to his marvelous light, there's absolutely nothing impossible yeah. for him. And to, it's crazy because the, the enemy thought he tried to bury me a long, long time ago. He tried to bury me, but what he didn't know, that I was a seed. And that a seed that all it needed to be was watered and fertilized. And then it grew into a tree. And he can't do that to me no more. Because I'm covered by the love of God. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but now he's given me a mission and a vision as, as I was going. Like, where did he want me? You know, I was in Florida. I, I, I was in a successful practice over there, seeing lots of families, lots of kids, overcoming so many sickness and disease. But God was calling me to the state of Louisiana. Um, Louisiana is the sickest state in the country. 50th out of 50th. There's more diabetes, more heart disease than anywhere in the world, anywhere in the United States. And God was pulling me here. And he showed me a vision um, for, especially when I stepped foot here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. When I stepped foot here, I knew this is exactly where I was supposed to be. I knew this is exactly where he wanted me to sow seeds and to love people and to serve people was right here. And so my vision, like I don't see sickness and disease here. I see people healed. I, I see people, 
I see people overcoming every type of sickness and disease. And it's already done. Yeah. Like it's not, oh, like, I, like in reality, like what we see in our natural eyes, yes. I mean, there's people on 12 medications. There's people on sick, on house beds and hospitals. But for me in my vision, like I don't see that. I see people, you know, I see hospitals tearing down wings because people are so healthy. I see the, the governor calling Lake Charles trying to figure out why are people so healthy. Yeah. What, 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 what are uh, the other parishes that need to be doing that Ten y'all times, are doing? Ten times better. Ten times better, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know? And so, but anyways, I can go on and on about that. But uh, So you, you describe the limit breaker in your life yes. as the love of God. It was God's love that broke the shackles. Yes. that broke the limits, that caused you to be able to see like you've never seen before? Yes, like, um, you know, for me, I had a lot of trust issues. I've been abandoned all my life, so it's... Um, so would you say trust is one of the greatest trust challenges Trust is probably that you had? one of the, okay. the greatest things because of um, a lot of the times um, it's hard to trust. It's still, it's still hard. It's still hard to trust people, um, to let them in, you know, of all the pain that I've suffered. And so it's, um, but when I knew that there was, that there was something different in his word, like, you know, they, I remember my parents used to always take me to church, you know, I call my mama, I call them, the people, the strangers that I talk to you about, I call my mom and dad today. And when they started taking me to, to church, and um, I started hearing these things from the pastor, and, uh, and they spoke about love, and they spoke, spoke about trust, spoke about faith, and I didn't know what that was. Um, but what I had to do was I had to seek his face. I had to seek his word. Mm-hmm. That's the only way. Mm-hmm. But for me, I had, to, I had to go through that book and read every page and see what was real, because I didn't know what was real. You know, everybody in my life has either neglected me, abandoned me, has hurt me, abused me in all types of ways. And to, to, to see and hear about a father who, who loves and gives and has, has, has mercy, has grace, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't judge me for who I was and what I did, um, it just was, it was foreign to me. I didn't know what that was. So I ha- it had to be real. And so I started digging into that, into that word. And that's when I found out that, you know, I'm above and not beneath. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm more than a conqueror. Yes. You know, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm, uh, and, and there's nothing that the enemy can do to me to really stop me when I know whose I am. And, and that's when I began to trust in God before I trusted people. There's no way I couldn't trust people if I didn't trust that my Savior. And so, like, once I started trusting him and trusting in his word and having faith in his word, that's when God started moving me to trust others, to do stuff, uh, let other people do stuff for me. <laughs> so I, I, I'm a survivor. <laughs> I, I, I do everything on my own. <laughs> like, I don't need anyone. But what, what, I, what, what God started teaching me is that, yes, you do. Yeah. You know, that like, the, the, the reason I'm here is for connection. Yeah. You know, we're not meant to be isolated. Right. We're meant to be in a body, right. in a body of people that you can trust yes. and to love yes. and to raise you up yes. and um, to have mentors to guide you through this, um, that you can see God through. You know, that he can, gut, that he can, that you can actually seek the word through other people as you seek the word on yourself. And so, like, uh, but trust is a big, is, is a big thing because of all the pain that I suffered. And um, trust and probably the biggest thing that probably broke through was um, identity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about this, that the trust factor was important for you to be able to recognize as the element that, that created limitation. Because when, when, as he described, whenever that trust is not in place, then it produces isolation. Mm-hmm. 
a bad place to be. It's a bad place to be because it is a place that the enemy takes full advantage, mm -hmm. takes full advantage of yeah. you, uh, especially uh, in, in under pressure and in vulnerable situations. And you're isolated, and then the enemy attacks, and, and that's how he takes people out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but for you to recognize the trust issue and to resolve that, and so it's almost like, what is the thing that limits you? Ident identifying that. What is that thing that you have a hard time getting beyond or getting over? Identifying that and then applying the word to that to overcome so that the enemy can't use it against you. Yeah. But that you can use it. I heard somebody say that it doesn't become your tombstone. It becomes a stepping stone. Yeah. It helps you to get above that. So what you are doing, because it's not over, yeah. it's, it's not finished, it's just, started. it's just started, but what you are doing is what I refer to as proving the will of God. I think that our lives should prove God's will. How many of you yeah. agree with that? You, yeah. That our lives should be a demonstration and a proving of God's will to the world. And the Bible says in Romans 12 and verse 2, they can put that up on the screen, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is God's will, which, by the way, is good and acceptable and perfect. So, but it happens when we allow our minds to be renewed. And that's, that, that was the process for you. Can you talk a little bit about that, how your mind had to change, how your mind had to go from the subways of New York City to a bed? Um, Learning how to put the covers over yourself. You know, what, what, what was that process like? Um, it was a grueling process <laughs> because all my life, um, as a young age, I uh, I believed that um, I was never meant to do anything. Um, you know, I was um, gonna be in this shell. Um, I was fearful, shameful. Um, I had shame, uh, a fear of this connection. Um, that who's next? Who, who's going to abandon me? Uh, who's going to hurt me? Who's next? You know? And I, I, and I walked through, even, you know, uh, school through that. I, I, I walked, you know, I, I can sit down on a table with my parents, my mom and dad now, and still feel that inside. I may not show it. You know, I create this mask, <laughs> I may not show it, but it's there and it's painful. And really what helped me overcome that is knowing not about who I am, but whose I am. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said before, I started reading that book um, and it, become, it became alive. Yeah. It, it became like a person speaking to me. Yeah. It, it was like it, it, those words came out the book and started going into my heart and I was hungry. I, I wasn't hungry for natural food. I was hungry for spiritual food. I was, I was hungry for life. I, I never experienced life before until I opened up that book. And, and, and then that's when I experienced the love. It was so overwhelming. It was, I, I just, I started crying. Like, I'm not a crier. I was just started crying. And, start, and every single day when I started reading that book, because it was the truth. And when you experience truth, you experience freedom. And when you experience freedom, you, you become alive. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, and all those things that were limiting me, that was shame and brokenness and, and fear and, you know, a shame of my past, uh, of even the uncertainty of my future. I didn't know was, what was going to happen in the future. Um, I, I didn't know. I knew what happened in my past, and I know I didn't want that, you know? And so, so how do I overcome that? is I read his word. 
and I started believing whatever was in his word. And despite what was going on around me, it had nothing to do with what was going around me. It has everything to do with God has created what's within me. And how did I find that out? It was right in there. So it sounds like a new reality, yeah. because you were living a reality, yeah. but you were being introduced to a, a, an entirely new reality that was totally contrary to the one you had lived out. Yes. And it was just as available to you as the one you had been a victim of. Mm-hmm. And God was exposing a new reality. And I think a lot of times what we, we read the Bible, we believe it to a degree, but it's like there's a picture there that God has established as his reality for our lives. And it's up to us to embrace that and to receive that as our own. As my, so like when he said, he says, when I see Lake Charles, I don't see, I don't see people sick. I see people healed. I see, I, I see the governor calling Lake Charles saying, why are people so healthy there? What he's talking about is switching realities, allowing God's reality to become his reality and, and, how, and, and operating in defiance against the current state of affairs. Yes, you, you adopt God's nature, yes. yeah. like his way of seeing things. You have a different lens that you look through. You know, a lot of the times... Um, when I speak to people, they believe that um, God's holding them back. <laughs> like, oh, no, it's like God's holding something from them. Okay, I got a scripture for that. Go for it. Let's put it up. Second <laughs> Corinthians 9 and 8. It says, and God is able to make how much grace? All grace. Yeah. Abound, that means come to you in abundance. Yeah. That you may have always have what? All sufficiency in what? All things and abound to what? Every good work. Look at all. Now I underline the words in there. All, 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 every. And I missed one. Can y'all tell me which one I missed? Always. I missed always. So there's one, two, three, four, five references to un. Limited potential capacity ability of God to flow through our lives. I'm telling you, the only limit that we have is the limit that's in our minds, and it's the limits that we've created in our image of of ourselves and who we see and how we see ourselves. He had to change. You had to literally change the way you saw yourself. Yes, I had to change everything. I had to change the way I saw people. You know, fearfully and wonderfully made, I had to see people that way. You know, not as somebody who's going to hurt me, who's going to lead me the wrong way, um, because I saw that. I saw that all the time. <laughs> uh, but I had to see people for who God has called them to be. And that's why I won't judge anyone. Who am I to judge? I've done everything. <laughs> and so, like, um, I, I see people for who they are and their potential that's inside of them. And, like, uh, because of that, um, I'm able to, to relate to a lot of people, especially her. I feel like I felt the greatest hurt of all, which is being alone. I think that's the greatest hurt of all, not knowing that somebody's in front of you, beside you, behind you, helping you, is just being alone. And But when you realize that you have a, a, a friend that sticks closer than a brother and who's right there with you, who's in you, who's in front of you already, who, who, who was already behind you and who's right beside you, um, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. And so, like, um, and knowing that the enemy's already defeated and that you're victorious, um, it just empowers you. It gives you a sense of certainty and of love and of confidence that you can walk every single day knowing, yes, things may, may, may be chaos around me. It has nothing to do with the chaos. It has everything to do with who he is within me. Mm. And so... Um, so today, you're in Lake Charles. Yes. You have a practice here in Lake Charles. What's the name of your business? It's a Life by Design Chiropractic. And, you, and you're located on Dillard Loop. Yes. Dillard uh, Loop is out there by... R- r- right by uh, Lowe's, Walmart right off Highway 14. Uh, across the street from Kyoto's Japanese Steakhouse. 
Yeah, see, they know where that's at. They, they, they know where that's at. <laughs> oh, I got you now. I got you. <laughs> so tell us your mission there. What is it that you do there? And what's, what's, what, you're, what are you going after in this okay. practice? OK, well, uh, there's a lot of things I'm going after. Uh, let's see. If we, uh, I'll add one more thing. That's okay. Um, there's something about presence that I've been um, learning and growing in because um, a lot of people, um, when you wake up in the morning, 80% of your thoughts are from the past. 15% of your thoughts are for the future, and about 5 to 10% is right now, is for the presence right here, for the present. So most of the time, we live our lives either in the past or in the future, and we never get to experience life where we are right now. And so as I, I go into my practice every morning, I, I, I have to get myself in, in, a, in a state, in, 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 a, um, in, in a focus of presence. Because every patient that walks through that door deserves 100% of me. Not 5%, not 10%, no, not, none of that. It, ha it needs everything in me so, and me empty so God can flow through me because I experience healing in my office. Like I, I rebuke all sickness and disease that has, that, that there's no sickness and disease there. And so you may be walking in with 10 medications and heart disease, high blood pressure, everything, but you're walking while healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. So my vision and for people to experience is a presence. I, I, like um, for, for my 10-year goal, mm -hmm. literally, I see what four offices all around Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, people, I mean, tons of people. Um, like I said before, I, I see the governor calling Lake Charles, Louisiana, and the mayor figuring out, like, what are y'all doing? Well, it started right here in New Life Church. That's where it started. People getting off their medication. People living the life that they were, they, they were meant to live. You know? And all those shackles and all those chains are broken. Uh, being tied because as I talk to people all around, I talk everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Because I have a mission and a vision. And I, I talk everywhere. And I, and, and I talk to people and I see that people are chained by their diagnosis. And, and, and they, 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 they're, they're, they're shackled by their, all their, their medications. And, and, and they actually believe that they were born sick, they were destined for disease, and then literally they have to have a, a diagnosis for the rest of their life. And that, and, that, and that health, actually health, actually comes from a bottle of pills or an organ taken out of your body. Like God did a mistake to put your gallbladder in your, in, your, in, in your body. God didn't do a mistake in your life. Like, literally, he, he was, that you were meant to be healed. Yes. Period. Yes. Yeah. Like, you experienced heaven on earth. If we actually believe that, if we actually believe that, we, that, that heaven is on earth, then there is no sickness in heaven. That's right. There is none. You know, like, um, like, as I said before, you know, Christians, uh, some Christians believe that, you know, God is holding something holding us back or holding something uh, from us. Well, I mean, when Adam and Eve thought the same thing. Adam and Eve thought the same thing. And as, I, and as I think about that and I talk about that, like, heaven actually gave us the most expensive thing they had to offer. And it was Jesus Christ. Yes. It gave him up for you and me. Yeah. And I think that right there is the biggest, biggest uh, uh, um, action of the love of God. Yeah. And so as I see Lake Charles, yes, I see no sickness and disease. But in 10 years, I see a revival as I go through. I see this building even getting exploding. I see me being a part of this mission and vision that Paxton Orman and this church has. 
Um, I, when I first met <laughs> Pastor Norman, it was at FedEx, which is crazy. Uh, didn't think anything of it. And then I saw him at Starbucks again. And I knew, oh, wow. I was like, okay, there's something God is doing. And that's when he invited me to his church, and I, I stepped foot. I was like, yes, this is exactly where God is planning me to be. Amen. Amen. But no, I, 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 I see people healed. Amen. We're, we're going to do a couple of things, but one thing that I recognize here is, is there's an anointing. Yes. Yes. And, and it's called a grace. That scripture that we had up just earlier, it says, God is able to make all grace, all grace meaning inclusive of multiple dimensions of grace, types of grace. And this is a grace that you are witnessing here today. Yeah. And you're actually a minister of health. Yeah. You're a minister of health. And I have here the anointing is the operative grace of God that enables you to perform, which includes to endure, to resist, and to overcome. I'll read it again. The anointing is the operative grace. There's that unmerited grace, but then there's an operative grace that enables you to perform, which includes endure, resist, and overcome. Now, you can do things without that anointing, but very limited impact and very limited power. As a matter of fact, whatever you do without that anointing is subject to crumble before your very eyes. So that's what Paul meant in my assessment in Philippians 4.13 when he says, I can do all things through Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is Jesus' description. The word Christ means the anointed one and the embodiment of that anointing. So it's through the anointing and through the grace that we're strengthened to do what we're called to do. What we're called to do. Uh, next week at 3.30 right here in New Life. Uh, Dr. Antonio is going to do a health seminar. Do you have yeah. some details on that? What, what, yes, what are you going to uh, focus on? You know, a lot of people, what I've noticed that people struggle with heart disease, cancer, and uh, of course, chronic pain. And so what I'm going to be speaking about is those three things. You know, a lot of people um, say they're cancer survivors. And um, I hear that. And as of what I teach in my office is to become a cancer killer. Yeah. Amen. Because you have the ability inside of you, inside of you, you have the ability inside of you to overcome all sickness and disease. Um, it just cannot be interfered with. And so if you find whatever's interfering with your body's ability to heal, you correct that, and your body will do the work. And so, like I always like to say, I'll do my part, you do your part, and the rest is up to God. Because God is, is going to heal you. It's just a matter of time. It's just you got to find whatever's interfering with your body's ability to heal. So I'll speak about cancer. I'll speak about heart disease and how to overcome those things, not just survive them, not just to maintain your diabetes, or maintain your heart disease so it won't get too high, too low, or anything like that, is actually, what are the steps to actually reverse whatever you have? Because yes, I've seen it thousands of times. People overcome cancer, diabetes, heart disease, um, people's eyesight come back, hearing come back, you know, like, 
I, I, I've, seen, I've seen it all. And like, uh, do I know it's possible? Absolutely. All things are possible for those who believe. And so like, yes, that's what I'll be talking about. So uh, Patrick, where's Patrick? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Miss, um, Miss Tanya, if you could, I would like, who, who, this is Sunday next week, Sunday at 3.30 p.m. That's what it's going to be. If you think you even may be remotely interested in that, can I see your hand of those who did? Okay. I want to know that so we know how to prepare for it, uh, whether we we'll hold it here or next door. So we just need a way for you to just, just write your name down. Yes, all you need to do is write your name down. If you can help me on your way out in the lobby, Ms. Tanya will be there to take your name. So we'll get a, an approximate head count, and we'll know how to prepare for that. But that's, that's an awesome gift, and he's doing that as a gift to the church and to you. Amen? We're going we're gonna to follow up with this next week. Dr. Debbie and I are going to be uh, conducting a workshop, a, a Dream Builders workshop, and just kind of taking us through some practical steps along with the teaching on, on how we, what's the first step? What is the first step that we take into this uh, getting our dreams uh, coming to pass? But what I want to do right now, I want, I want to, to have Dr. Antonio pray, but I want him to pray for people who believe God has, has spoken to them or has endowed them with a gift of divine health to lay hands on the sick and they recover. I want him to pray for you, to release a grace, an anointing on you for that particular ministry. So if that's you, if you just come to the altar, I'll just have him pray for you before we finish up here today. Now we're not done, so don't leave, but let's, let's do this. So these are people that say, you know what? I believe God has called me to lay hands on the sick mm -hmm. and they recover. Yes. Amen. 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 This is awesome. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord God. Your, say, your word says when two or more gather together that you are in their midst, Lord God. It's all of us and you. Lord, I pray for your presence that's in this place, Father. Yes. Lord, I rebuke all sickness, disease, Lord God. I rebuke it out of this place in the name of Jesus and out of their bodies. It has no place in them, Father. I pray, Lord God, that your presence will overwhelm them, Father. Yes. That you will strengthen, strengthen their bodies, Father. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that your love and your peace that passes all understanding, whether they've been diagnosed, whether their um, head is there, whatever it is, whatever is going on with their health, Lord God, I proclaim them healed yes. in the name of Jesus, name Lord God. Jesus. And we thank you in advance, Lord God, because this is not something that we have to pray for every single day because, Lord, we believe it already. It's already done. I call it done in the name of Jesus. Jesus name. Lord God, I thank you, Lord God. We stand in faith, Lord God, that it's already done, Lord. Lord, that they are healed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Lord, we believe this, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you'll give them peace, give their families peace yes. that passes all understanding. Lord, I pray this for their families. I pray this for them, that, Lord, that you, Lord, you embody them a belief a supernatural belief that only comes from you. Yes. And when those times that feel dark, those times, Lord God, that they feel like they, that, that there's nothing's working, that why am I this way? Why am I, uh, why don't I feel my feet? Why do I have to take all these medications? Why do I have headaches all the time? Why is my blood pressure so high? Why is my sugar level so high? Why can I not see? Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you're overwhelming that very moment yes. with your love. 
Lord, so every chain, every shackle will be broken in the name of, in the Jesus. Name of Jesus. It will have no power over me. The only power that has over us, Lord God, is your power. Because every power and every healing, Lord God, comes from you, despite what doctor is in front of them. Lord, we thank you in advance. We thank you for your love and for the miracle, Lord God. It's not going to just be a miracle. It's going to be a normality in this church. Yes. Healing will be experienced, Lord God. Lord God, it will be miracles for the outside world. Thank you, Lord. But it will be a normality here in your life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, now what you have here for people that have come to receive of the grace you have, yes. they want to flow yes. more proficiently in that anointing of divine health. So I want you to release that on them. Yes. These are ministers of health. Yes. Yes. Amen? Yes. So in part. God. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord God. We just thank you, Father. Yes. Lord God, for the healing that's it right now. Yes. That's in this place for every person. Lord God, that has their hands raised, Father. Yes. Lord, I touch them in the name of Jesus. Yes. yes. Lord God, they shall be healed from the inside out, Father. Yes. That only comes from them, O oh Father. I thank you, Lord God, in advance. Lord yes. God, the part health, healing, restoration. Yes. Lord God, broken bones shall be healed. Yes. Cholesterol shall be lowered. Yes. Lord God, high blood pressure will be lowered. Love will be experienced. Every yes. cell in their body. Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, will be healed. Hallelujah. Every every yes. neuron, yes. their brain, yes. everything in the name of Jesus, yes. Lord. They can feel their legs. They can feel their hands in the name of Jesus. Their eyesight is back. They're hearing, Father. Normal strokes. Strokes, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke any type of cancer. I rebuke it. Get out of here in the name of Jesus. It has no belonging. None in the na in name of Jesus, Father. I thank you, Lord God, for the love that's in this place, for the healing that new life is going to experience. Lord God, it has no hold. Lord God, I rebuke the shackles. The shackles, the chains are broken right now. The shackles are broken right now in the name of Jesus. It has no place over this place. It has no place over every human, every cell in the body in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, for the miracle, for the normality that's happening, Father. I release that in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I release that and I impart in every person, every human that's right here in the name of Jesus in this altar. I glorify your name, Lord God. Raise your hands in the name of Jesus. You're healed. Say you're healed in the name of Jesus. I am healed. I am healed in the name of Jesus. Thank him in advance. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Now, thank you, Lord. As we said earlier, the image. So you have to, as he said, Lord. see yourself healed. Yes. As you see yourself healed, yes. now I release healing yes. to those around me. Yes. And this is something that you don't you don't you don't sit around and wait for some feeling to come over you. Yes. Notice what Jesus right. did. He was just walking and he saw somebody sick. Oh. It wasn't it was it was the uh, it was the enemy and what he was doing to people that drew him to rescue them and let the Holy Spirit guide you in that and you have to practice and you practice in several ways one is speaking life everybody it's not intended for you to lay hands on everybody okay Jesus didn't even lay hands on everybody but he would speak as he would walk he would speak some he spoke to and then some he laid hands on okay so you let the Holy Spirit guide you and direct you and, and go forth and be ministers of health in Jesus' name. Amen.